Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Jayati and Chandru to invite me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about debt for nature swaps. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm talking about debt for nature swaps today, um, which are basically financial instruments that decrease a country's sovereign debt and at the same time increase funds for conservation. Um, in a way, it sort of sounds like a magical solution that solves both of our problems in this conference. Um, so which is why I'm basically looking at whether it is a cure-all financing alternative for climate and debt uh, sustainability. So to start with, uh, debt for nature uh, swaps are a financial instrument that allows countries to free up their fiscal resources from servicing debt and redirecting those resources into funds for conservation. Um, so they're basically a package deal in a way that they aim to solve debt, dis uh, debt distress and to reduce debt burden and to um, help solve environmental crisis by a single maneuver. Um, started with the Latin American crisis, uh, with the first ever debt for nature swap was signed in uh, signed by Bolivia in 1987, and that after that has been implemented uh, for uh, over 30 countries, and there have been 1.2 billion uh, conservation projects under these swaps, uh, exceeding 2.6 billion dollars globally. And the reason um, I'm talking about this today is because recently you have seen um, debt for nature swaps gain popularity after a certain period of being dormant, um, particularly with the swaps with um, Belize, Seychelles, um, and Ecuador. So basically, um, yeah, so how do these swaps work? Um, so a simple bilateral agreement between creditor and debtor countries uh, can be carried out as such. Um, a creditor country cancels a portion of the debt um, known as the face value reduction. Uh, it may or may not involve partial debt forgiveness. And in turn, the debtor country is required to generate conservation funds in local currency with the freed up fiscal resources now that it no longer has to service that debt. Um, and a multilateral agreement um, often involves a non-governmental organization that facilitates the swaps uh, through the secondary market in case it's a commercial debt owed to a commercial creditor. Um, the NGO purchases the debt at the secondary market at a discount rate where the commercial creditors accept a haircut, um, most likely because uh, the debt um, that is being swapped was unlikely to be serviced in full by the debtor country. Uh, the NGO then allows the debtor country to buy back the discounted debt and where the money is then invested in conservation projects in the debtor country overseen by the NGO. So we're asking two crucial questions. Debt for nature swaps promise to jointly answer the questions of debt and conservation. Uh, so the simple question we should be asking is that, does it really do both of those things at once? Do, do these swaps uh, significantly reduce debt burden? And do these swaps entail effective or quality conservation efforts? So more or less, are these swaps answering both our debt question and our nature question? Um, moving through this very fast, um, I'm mostly looking at uh, four main case studies. Um, of countries that undertook date for, debt for nature swaps between the time period of uh, 2000 to 2015. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about uh, the Belize case later on. So yeah, starting with the Indonesia case, they had three debt for nature swaps. Um, they were bilateral in nature and it was under the Tropical Forest Conservation Act initiated by the US government. Um, and they had three sort of back-to-back -back, uh, swaps in 2009, 2011, and 2014. And I'm going to be looking at this case to explore how it answers the debt question. So whether 
external debt stock was actually reduced by this particular swap, uh, whether there was any change, any decrease in the debt servicing that they had to do or interest payment, and also was there any hard currency relief. So um, here we can see that the amount of debt that was canceled uh, in these three swaps, um, firstly was around uh, 30 million, 28.5 million, and then 12 million. And when we see that amount in relation to the external debt stock they had uh, at the time, uh, we can see as a percentage that only covers 0.03% or less of the country's external debt stock burden. Um, so naturally, there is a scalability issue. Um, so this is from the World Bank statistics. I then looked at uh, Bank of Indonesia statistics to look at uh, how much external debt was owed by the government and central bank in terms of US dollars. And even according to those statistics, we can see that the share of debt reduction through the swap was 0.08% or less. So is it answering the debt question? Possibly not. Um, Okay, then does this really show a decrease in debt servicing um, at all? So this is what I pulled up from the actual agreement that they had, um, the schedule of payments according to that agreement. And very quickly, if you look at the bottom of this table where you can see uh, the total amount of debt reduced given by debt reduction around uh, 28.5 million, um, if you compare the interest column of outstanding obligations canceled, you can see it was around 1 million of interest payment was canceled. And whereas, um, according to the swap, their new obligations for interest payments was close to 2.6 million. So we can very clearly see that interest payment, instead of being saved, it actually went up. So not much of an effect in their external debt stock burden, not much of an effect at all in terms of their interest payment savings. Um, technically, uh, what this swap actually did was close to a sort of debt rescheduling, where all Indonesia got out of the swap was an extended maturity period and nothing more. So, Going on to the next uh, case study I have, um, we've talked a lot about Ghana's debt crisis in the past two days, so I will quickly gloss over it. But the one thing I would like to uh, highlight, um, according to the Ghana case, um, Ghana was the one country um, among a few others that I found that had both a debt for nature swap and uh, also had debt restructuring done under the HIPC initiative. Um, so. In terms of looking at how it fared in both cases, um, the only bit of um, the only thing I'd like to highlight in this scenario was um, it's uh, Ghana's case uh, sheds a light on the fact that these swaps are used more of a preemptive measure rather than actually trying to reduce debt burdens. So. Um, debt for nature swaps are more likely to be taken when the country is not actually in very high debt distress. But um, as we can see here, when the 1992 swap was undertaken, uh, Ghana's external debt stocks were not um, as bad. Um, uh, the debt swap was close to a million dollars, um, whereas in uh, 2002, when it had the HIPC debt relief, uh, external debt stocks, it was faring uh, a lot worse during the time. So these have only been taken as just a preemptive measure um, and not directly as an intervention to help get over debt distress. So moving on to the nature question um, I had laid out uh, is what exactly are these countries doing or expected to do with the sort of fiscal resources that they're freeing up. Um, basically looking at the quality of the conservation efforts being taken by these swaps. 
So for this case, I look at both Peru and Indonesia. So Peru had two swaps uh, with the US under the same TFCA agreement, um, where again, as you can see, the swaps entailed 0.075% of the external debt stock, and the 2008 swap was a little more than 0.1% of their external debt stock. Um, yeah, so it reduced 14.3 million in 2002, uh, 25 million in 2008, and in return, it, Peru was asked to generate 10.6 million for conservation funds in, uh, as part of the 2002 swap, and 25 million um, in 2008. So what actually happened with those, uh, with those funds? So both of those swaps basically went into protecting two uh, national reserves in Peru, and uh, the Pacaya Samiria National Reserve and the Alto Peru National Park. Um, it was largely targeted towards um, preventing the problem of illegal logging uh, in Peru at the time, and five out of the 13 uh, projects focused on decreasing unauthorized timber extraction um, which consisted of uh, one-third of the funding allocation under the swap. So how did these um, projects really decrease unauthorized timber extraction? All it did was set up guard posts along uh, the borders of the national park, um, which um, many would agree is quite an old-fashioned way to look at conservation. So it had guard posts that would prevent illegal loggers going into the National Reserve. And that's basically most of what was done with the money. Um, and apart from that, uh, there were some training programs for the indigenous local communities to, uh, for the management and future generation of uh, their tree stocks. Um, but the majority of uh, the effort was just setting up the guard posts. Um, even despite uh, those guard posts that were given, uh, we still see that there's an increasing trend in the tree cover loss in that specific area of Peru. So um, illegal logging still remains a problem despite the two yellow bars which show the years the swap was undertaken. Um, so uh, despite the swaps, we can see that the tree cover loss has still been increasing in a way. And very quickly, going through uh, the conservation effects uh, in Indonesia, it was the 2011 uh, swap was the first one with a red focus. Um, and uh, what is crucial to see here, commodity-driven deforestation and urbanization contribute to um, permanent tree cover loss, and commodity-driven deforestation uh, is largely correlated um, correlated with the illegal logging practices. And as you can see, like the green lines indicate, again, the years that the swaps were taken. And although we can see some downward uh, trends in tree cover loss, uh, it still reached its peak way after the third swap was enacted. So um, we don't know what happened there with the swap. Um, okay, so a very interesting case is the Belize case. Belize had two swaps 20 years apart, uh, one in 2001 and one in 2021. Um, and the key distinction between the two swaps was in the 2021 swap, uh, the private sector was involved. And um, so starting with the 2001 swap, uh, which was also a U.S. bilateral swap with Belize. Um, the face value reduction was uh, close to 9.7 million, um, equaling to 1.6 of their external debt stock. Um, there was an outright forgiveness of 1.4 million, um, which basically uh, meant that uh, the government of Belize would have to pay 7.2 million plus interest to local conservation organizations. Um, comparing that to the Belize 2021 swap, um, 20 years ago, the swap was around 9.7 million. 
Now it's 553 million, thanks to the private sector, um, where the face value reduction uh, was in the form of reducing uh, the 553 million super bond. And how that came, uh, came along was uh, a TNC subsidiary, which was set up in Delaware, called the Belize Blue Investment Company. Um, it transferred funds from Credit Suisse, uh, funds equaling 364 million, lent that to Belize. Belize used the 364 to buy back the 553 million super bonds. And Belize now technically owes a smaller loan, not uh, to the commercial creditors, but to BBIC. And Credit Suisse uh, issued the 364 million uh, in the first place in, as blue bonds and transferred that to BBIC to be lent to Belize. And Credit Suisse now owes new bondholders of the blue bonds. So the total transaction cost was expected to be around uh, 10 million, but um, it eventually ended up being close to 86 million, which was incurred by Belize. And this basically went into uh, Credit Suisse's cut, and in a sense, essentially, Belize was paying for the interest that was paid to Credit Suisse's new bondholders. So at the end, it ended up costing, it, Belize ends up owing around 450 million to, uh, to both Credit Suisse and BBIC. So altogether, it comes across as a very expensive, costly agreement to facilitate for very little gain. So what these case studies show us is whether these uh, swaps are actually a cure-all solution. So we have seen that there is a very minimal reduction in their external debt, swap, uh, uh, external debt stock. Um, there are heterogeneities in these agreements, um, which is crucial because um, in the case of Indonesia swap, there was not actually any hard currency relief because Indonesia was expected to pay uh, pay back their debt in U.S. dollars. So the promise of there being hard currency relief was not in that particular agreement. So um, we have to be mindful of the heterogeneities that go into several of these agreements. Um, there were high transaction costs highlighted by Belize's case and obviously very less than optimal conservation efforts. Um, so what could be the way forward for this being uh, a viable financing alternative? First of all, they have to be redesigned in a way where they're scaled up, preferably without the help of the private sector, and they uh, include a component of nature preservation in a way that it has a bigger impact. And how that bigger impact might come across is when we start to look at nature and then expand that notion of nature to encompass not just cordoning off uh, a land resource, but rather it, it, it being seen as a way of increasing resilience, building resilience in a way that these debtor countries can better withstand from future climate shocks and even their systemic challenges. Um, yeah, so that is all for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much. I'm gonna move Para, please. Yeah, you wanna, um, yeah. We're going to move it. And then, um, no, but I do have slides. No, can I, can I? Yeah. Sorry. You can see there. Yeah, but I can't see it here. No, you can see it on that screen, but I can't see it on this screen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> when in doubt, move left, correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have
have to ask you 